You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. Your next stop... Views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. But they should be. Not the, not the views of the station and everybody else, a lot, or a lot of people, but they should be because they are a word from the Lord. The thoughts of this program are uh, coming to you from the Bible, and that is our, always our goal and our desire to uh, give you uh, what the Bible is saying. And uh, so that's what we're trying to do this very night. I want to welcome you to the program. Here's how you can reach me if you would like to uh, have a Bible study with us or any, uh, any of the information that we're having that's free of charge. Uh, Word from the Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. 276-340-2653 uh, is my phone number. And uh, we'll be glad to uh, study with you, talk with you, visit with you, anything we can do. We have uh, uh, books that we give away. I don't have a copy of uh, A Muscle and a Shovel. But if you would like a copy of this book, it's free. And uh, we'll be glad to get that out to you. Just simply contact us. And uh, especially if you're in the area, we'd like to uh, get that out to you. And uh, <clears throat> do anything we can to help you uh, understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so we want you to know that we, you are our friend. We, we do love you and appreciate you watching. And we hope that if you have a question, you will take us up on uh, on the, uh, uh, the offer to, to study the Bible with us. Tonight I want to start off with this verse that we find in, in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 37, verse 17. The, the context is a very interesting context. But in this context, Zedekiah asks Jeremiah a very, very important question. Zedekiah the king sent and took Jeremiah out, out of prison, and the king asked him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? Now the context is Jeremiah has been telling the children of Israel, and we're telling the king that the, uh, the, the Babylonians are coming. They're going to come and they're going to uh, overthrow the city, overthrow Jerusalem. And uh, the Babylonians have come and they have besieged the city. But they heard that the Egyptians had uh, come up to fight against them, and so the Chaldeans pulled away and left. And so everybody in the city thinks, well, hey, the, the Chaldeans are leaving. But Jeremiah tells the people, he says, no, don't you think, don't think for a minute that the Chaldeans are gone because they're going to come back. As a matter of fact, they're going to come back so strong that even if, uh, even, even if all that was left of the, of the army, and I'm going to get this up uh, uh, verse 10, here's what Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 37, 10. He said, For though ye had smitten the whole army of the Chaldeans that fight against you, and there remained, and there remained but wounded men among them, yet should they rise up every man in his tent and burn this city with fire. And so they, they accused Jeremiah of being a traitor. said, You've gone off and you've, you've joined, uh, you've fell, fallen into the Chaldeans. You're on, on, his, on their side. And he said, I did not fall away to the Chaldeans. And so they put him in jail because they didn't like the message. But the bottom line was he was giving them a word from the Lord. And Zedekiah the king calls Jeremiah, gets Jeremiah out of prison, <coughs> and, uh, and calls him and then asks him that question that we just read there in verse 17. He says, is there any word from the Lord? And Jeremiah said, yes, there is. But the word that Jeremiah gave them was not always what they wanted to hear. He tells Zedekiah, he says, well, here's what's going to happen to you. They're, they're going to come, they're going to take the city. Now, you may have thought that there was going to be a good message, a cheerful message. But friends, sometimes the message uh, is just like what Jeremiah gives Zedekiah. You're not going to like it. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be pleasant to hear. But nonetheless, it's still a word from the Lord. Now, friends, what we're doing tonight is we are intent on giving you a word from the Lord. We're doing our best to give you what God has to say to you. Now, I want you to consider Samuel the prophet. Now, here's another prophet that we're talking about. Samuel the prophet <coughs> was a man who <coughs> gave the people 
a word from the Lord. Notice this in 1 Samuel 3 and verse 1, the, the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Now, what does that mean, open vision? Well, an open vision is no revelation from God. But notice what it said about Samuel. Samuel 3, verses 19 and 20. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, that's from the, 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 the furthest north point to the furthest south, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. Why? Because his words came to pass. They didn't fall to the ground. When Samuel spoke a word from the Lord, you knew that that is what God said because he was proven to be a prophet. Now, you might be saying, well, how, do, how does a person know whether, whether he was a prophet or not? How do you know how is he established to be a prophet? Well, look at this. In 1 Samuel 9 and verse 9, now this is later on when, when Samuel's getting older. Before time in Israel, this is Saul going to talk to, to Samuel. But before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, come, let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So a prophet was someone that you went to to inquire of God. What is a word from the Lord? Where are we going to get a word from the Lord? Well, you have to get it from a prophet. You had to get it from someone that was established to be a spokesman for God, someone that you knew you could count on as giving you a message that was from God. Now, here's what we had to ask then. Do you have prophets today? Well, no. The answer to that is no. But we still have a word from the Lord. There is still a place where you can get a word from the Lord. And a word from the Lord now comes through his son, not a prophet, but comes through his son who has spoken to us through uh, his word. Notice in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, and God who is under times and in diverse manners, that is different, different ways and fashions, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Well, that's how they used to inquire of the Lord. That's how you used to get a word from the Lord, by the prophets. Different manners and, and, and ways, different, different uh, 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 methods, you might say. God revealed his will, his words to mankind. But it says, but hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So it is the Christ, Jesus Christ, who is now the spokesman for God. Jesus is the one who is doing the speaking. He is the one where you have to go to get a word from the Lord. But I want you to notice something. When Jesus, if you want to hear a word from the Lord, you have to go to Jesus. But Jesus' words are right here. The commandments of the Lord are in this book. Now, in uh, the past uh, few weeks, uh, uh, the latter part of last week, uh, last year, we were doing a number of uh, lessons uh, reviewing a, a book that was given to us, and, and the man that wrote the book said that, <clears throat> named Don Hopkins, he said that, you know, not all the words in this book are really true. But he would tell you which ones were not true and which ones are not true. Well, I deny that. I submit to you that all of the words in this book are words from the Lord. They are inspired by God and have been recorded and preserved for us so that we can know what a word from the Lord really is. Now, uh, when we're talking about getting a word from the Lord today, friends, what we're talking about is giving you only what comes from God through His Son and through His Word. See, Christ gave apostles and inspired writers His words. And that is what we have in this book. I want you to notice in John 17, John 17, and uh, we're going to look at verse, oh, I don't know, about verse 14, I guess. Jesus says, I have given them thy word. He's talking about his apostles. I have given them, he's praying to God, and he says, I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So 
Where can you get a word from the Lord? Well, you get it from God through his son, through the inspired writers that have been given God's word by Christ. Thus, you get a word from the Lord from this book. You get a word from the Lord from the Bible. And so that is what we're giving you. So when someone says, well, is there any word from the Lord? Yes, there is. It's right here. And friends, that is our goal. That is our intent is to always give you a word from the Lord. Peter said in 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Now, there are a lot of individuals that will speak as though they are giving you the oracles of God. But in reality, friends, they are not giving you a word from the Lord because the things that they teach, if they're contrary to or even not even in this book, there's no way that it can be a word from the Lord. There's no way that it can be uh, some, an answer that you got as, as, uh, from inquiring of God. See, in the old days, you went to the prophet and said, give me a word from the Lord, and he would tell you. He was established to be a true source for God's words. Well, th friends, this is the established true source for God's words right here. And that's why if you want to know a Bible answer, you have to go to this book. We don't give you a lot of I think, I feel, I believe, I, I, you know, I hope, I have a warm, fuzzy feeling, and that's my opinion. This is a word from the Lord. This is a message from the Bible, a message from God. Now, <clears throat> here's what we need to ask ourselves then. Are there any, are there any modern prophets today? Is there a way where you can get a word from the Lord that's other than or uh, you know, separate and apart from this book? Are there really any modern prophets today? There's a lot of people that claim to be modern prophets today. Now, Old Testament prophets, they spoke for the Lord. And one way that you verified whether they were true prophets of God, now sometimes you knew they were prophets of God, like uh, it was like Elijah and you called down fire from heaven and burned people up. That, that was a pretty good indication that they were speaking for God. Or like Elisha, who uh, uh, you know, called down fire from heaven and consumed an offering. So there, there are definitely ways that you can verify that someone is speaking for God if they did miracles. But if a prophet of old, if an Old Testament prophet was speaking for God just in foretelling, that is, they're going to tell you what's going to happen in the future, there's one way that you could verify if they were from God or not. Foretelling would always be determined by if what they said or what they did came to pass. Look at this. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18 and uh, verse 21. I think I just bumped a box here. All right. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 21. Here's what the, the Bible says about prophets. It says, and if thou shalt say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken? How do we know if it's a word from the Lord? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. All right? Now, here's what we're talking about. If, if you want to see... If a person was speaking from God, just see if it came to pass. See if, see if it was verified. See if it, it, it was true to what they said. Now notice in Ezekiel 33, in verse 33, God told Ezekiel, And when this cometh to pass, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. The one way you knew is if the words came to pass. Now, Old Testament prophecies, friends, were not just... Uh, Vague generalities, you know, like, well, I, I think it's, I, I see it's going to rain, you know, it's going to be some rainy days in the future. Well, yeah, more than likely there's going to be some rainy days in the future. But in the case of like, like Elijah the prophet, he said it's not going to rain for three and a half years and it didn't. Now that is a prophecy. 
See that? So you can't just say some vague generalities. I think it's going to get cold. That's not a prophecy. Or some of these so-called psychics today that see things and they find dead bodies. Well, let's buy a body of water and buy a tree. Friends, you know how many trees are by bodies of water? That is so vague. So, but the Old Testament prophet was very spe specific. And so if the things did not come to pass, you knew they were not from God. And so they could foretell things, and that was how you knew it was a word from the Lord. But you know what? A prophet also could know some things that were going to take place in the future and be ready when they actually took place. Let me give you an example. In 1 Kings chapter 14, so this is not really foretelling necessarily. It's just telling some things that no one else would know. Now that's, that's how you know about a prophet. But in 1 Kings... Fourteen. We're going to read about Abijah. And at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise, I pray thee, and disguise thyself, and thou shalt not be known to the wife of Jeroboam. That thou shalt not be known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee... Uh, to Shiloh, behold, there is Ahijah the prophet. I said, uh, um, I said Abijah was the prophet, but Ahijah the prophet, he was the, the other one was king. Uh, he said, you come down to Ahijah, which told me that I should be king over this people. Now notice this. Take thee ten loaves and cracknels and a cruise of honey and go to him he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. And Jeroboam's wife did so and arose and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. So here's Ahijah the prophet, and he's blind. All right, he can't really see very well. And so Jeroboam's wife is going to come. She's going to disguise herself. Now this is how a true prophet could react. He would know some things without actually being able to see them or know who a person is. Notice this, verse 5. And the Lord said unto Hijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shall I say unto her, for it shall be when she cometh in that she shall feign herself to be another woman. All right, so be ready, Hijah, because... This woman coming to you, she's going to pretend like she's somebody else. Verse 6. Uh, and it was so when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet, as she came in the door, he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? Why are you faking? Why are you, trying to, why are you pretending to be someone else? I'm a blind man, and I can see that. You know what, friends? Ahijah proved that he was a prophet of God because he could see some things when he was blind. Now that tells me one thing. That tells me some of these modern day prophets are definitely not prophets because a blind prophet of God can see better in the future than they can. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Here's a prophetess, a so-called prophetess that came to our tent a couple years ago when we were putting it up. And um, some of you probably have uh, seen this and heard this. I know we played it before. But listen, she came into the tent to see what was going on. Now, if she was a true prophetess, she would have seen this coming. Just like Ahijah, the blind prophet, could have, would have seen uh, Jeroboam's wife coming in and faking to be someone else. Well, if she was a prophetess, she would have known what she was, going, what she was in for. But here's what took place with the so-called prophetess. Well... And I hope she's going to play it. I didn't see that coming. Why? Because I'm, I'm not a prophet. All right. Let me see if I can find it here because I know I've got it on here. I was having a little trouble with my uh, hard drive a little earlier. And that was the problem. Bear with me.
Well, let me see here. I should have put this on my... Here we go. All right. That's all right. Oh, can't see that. All right. Moving right along here. This prophetess, uh, Mark, do you remember when this was? When this tent meeting was? 2010, Mark says. Possibly. And uh, I know where it is. So I'll just get over to it. Um, she was come in. She had her children with her, I believe. So she should have known what was going to happen. All right, here we go. See if this will play. Tell you what. Well, kind of. They're still trying to open it up. Here it goes. Are you getting audio on that, Matt? Yes, you are. If you demonstrate, I apologize. You are going to apologize. 
demonstrate, you demonstrate. And you gonna apologize to every person that's sitting in there right in front of me. I guarantee you, ma'am, if you so he gonna go out there and make you all a liar. He's gonna make you all a liar. I promise you, if you demonstrate you're an apostle, I'm not gonna be standing here saying that you listen, I know what I'm doing. Listen, you still talk. No, 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 I don't want to see your back no more. I'm saying if you demonstrate you're an apostle. I will not only apologize to you, but I guarantee you everybody here will be in your church in England. That's right. right. Yeah. You're going to apologize in front of all these people. If I, if I have to, if you, and you apologize to God. If you demonstrate, I'll apologize to everybody from, from here to If you demonstrate. Ma'am, come on back and bring your Bible, ma'am. When you demonstrate it, come on back and bring your Bible. And when you can't demonstrate it, then you apologize to everybody. How about that? When you demonstrate it, when you demonstrate it, I'll apologize. When you don't, you apologize. How about you that? You know what? I'm going to apologize because I know I'm right. Okay. okay. That's right. Then demonstrate it. You bring the demonstration that Paul said he had in 1 Corinthians 2 4, and I will apologize and everybody and will be here. And that's why you don't have the people. And if you can, then you, you, you apologize. Then you apologize. And you be here. And you be here the next time. You have been here in the people. Yes, you are. You are I'm telling people to prove it. 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 I'm and she wanted me to apologize to her because I, I doubted it. Well, you know what, friends? A true prophet or prophetess would not have to say, you're going to apologize to me. They just demonstrated that they knew something that there was no way anybody could know except God be with them. See that? And so I'm saying here is, here is a, a prophet we read about in the Bible that was blind and knew what was coming through the door. This lady said she was a prophetess and she had to come to the tent to see what was going on and didn't realize that she was going to be questioned and scrutinized when she said that she was a prophetess. Well, I think a blind man could have seen that coming if she'd read her Bible. So my point is when people claim to be prophets or get visions, uh, are they really giving you a word from the Lord? Just like I said, the, uh, Mr. Don Hopkins wrote a book and said he had visions about buying land and visions about ponies and visions about his dad dying and all this, and therefore you should listen to him. Friends, I'm not going to listen to anybody that's just spouting off uh, experiences they had as if that is God working through them. That is not how you know someone is a prophet or not. So the, what we need to ask then is, is it the case that there are prophets today? Well, look what Zechariah says, Zechariah 13 to verse 2. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall, no more be, they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Well, when did that take place? At what point did that take place? Would, at what point would there be no more prophets? At what point would there be no more uh, miraculous uh, manifestation? Well, notice this. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses, 10 through, verses 7 through 10, in the first century, the apostles inspired uh, men in the first century used miraculous gifts to verify or to confirm the words that they were speaking. Mark 16, let's go there first. Mark 16. <clears throat> Mark 16 and verse... Uh, uh, 17, these signs shall follow them to believe in my name. Shall they, ca shall they cast out devils? Uh, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. If they drink any uh, deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so, so then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he, received, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Now, friends, that is the purpose of miracles, to confirm the word. Now, now the, the so-called prophetess that we just uh, heard on, uh, on that video 
if she was truly a spokesperson, spokesperson for God, she would have confirmed her message with, with some kind of mir miraculous signs, but she didn't do it. She didn't do it. Now, the purpose of prophecy in the first century was to confirm the word. Now notice this. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, you're going to find that one of the gifts of uh, miraculous gifts <clears throat> was the gift of prophecy. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, uh, by the same, uh, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another uh, faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. <clears throat> But all these work of that one and self same spirit dividing to every man several as he will. So the gift of prophecy, that's what we're going to focus on. The gift of prophecy. That was in the first century. But notice what Paul is going to say about that gift of prophecy in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the very next chapter, the very next chapter, listen to what Paul says. He says, uh, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am, uh, I am nothing. Now, what about this prophecy? Let's come on down here. He says in verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether it be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, shall vanish away. These are three miraculous gifts that are given they stand for all of the miraculous gifts that we just read in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, prophecies, there's no, tongues, and knowledge, all that miraculous will cease. When? When is that going to happen, Paul? He said, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Now, this is a little, little tricky verse. A lot of people mis, uh, misunderstand it, confuse it, twist it. But it's very easy to understand if you think about what he's saying. Paul is talking about all of the miraculous gifts that were given in order to bring about the inspired, confirmed, fully, uh, a fully given Word of God, complete Word of God. And each prophet or each inspired person had a part of that whole revelation. For notice, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 29 through 31. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge, if any be revealed to another that sitteth by, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace, for ye all, for ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. So Different people might have different pieces of inspiration. Now, one thing you'll notice about these <clears throat> is they're all going to be agree in agreement. We'll get into that a little bit later. But all prophecy is going to be in agreement. But it's not all by one person. Different individuals had different pieces of inspiration. Now, notice this. In Romans 12, and verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given us, well, what are those gifts? We just talked about them in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, whether, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of the faith. So everybody might have had a little different piece. Everybody might have had a, a little different piece of the revelation, but when you put it all together, you have the whole. You have the whole. So when you get them together, when you get all the parts together, they make the whole. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 9, we know in part and we prophesy in part. See, everybody had a, had a, a, a different part here. Paul had a part and Peter had a part and Luke had a part and Mark had a part. And when you put them all together, you get a whole. We know in part and we prophesy in part. So here's what you have to realize, friends. 
that the parts were simply just that. They were parts of the whole. We know a part, we prophesy a part. So whatever the parts were, they were going to come together to make the whole. All right? They will come together to make that which is perfect. Now, friends, that's just the way God revealed his will. He didn't give it all to one person. He didn't give it all to Paul. He didn't give it all to Peter. He didn't give it all to Mark or to Matthew or to Luke or to John or, or, or Jude. He didn't give it all to them, but they put it in pieces. Notice this. God has always revealed his will little by little, line by line. In Isaiah, he tells Isaiah, But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. But when the whole is come together, then you have the complete, perfect, revealed will of God. That is why Paul says there in verse 10, 1 Corinthians 13, 10, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. The parts all had to have the same characteristics. And, and when you put all the parts together, they make the whole. If the parts are different, then you will not get a whole. You can't take all the parts and say, now here's the perfect. That's complete. Verse 10 <clears throat> clearly says, when, the, when the, the parts shall be done away, when the perfect is come. Now, some people are going to say, well, Jesus is perfect, and then the parts will be done away. No, Jesus is not the perfect in this scenario. Otherwise, you have Jesus being in parts. All right? You're on a word from the Lord. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I think I'm understanding what you're saying. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, these words, uh, these parts that they had was like keys. They could not unlock the truth or uh, what it was to be revealed unless each one had a key to for the lock. And uh, so uh, I understand what you're saying. Uh, okay. Talking about uh, some things that uh, uh, you, in the Old Testament and everything, uh, the old schoolmaster. Uh, uh, you ever re I know you read in the book of Job's, the 21st chapter, starting with about the uh, 12th verse of that, will explain a whole lot of what's going on in these churches these days. Okay. And the, uh, one more thing, the lady that uh, came there to the tent meeting, did she not think she would be examined if she come up saying she was a prophet? I well, don't understand I her thought. And yeah. To me, that showed that she wasn't much of a prophetess. To accept her word and not examine her? Yeah. Well, I think you can carry on. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Surely if she was a true prophetess, she would have known the, the kind of people she was coming to uh, talk to. Not that we're mean or vicious or whatever. I mean, you see everybody was sitting down. She was the one standing up and raising her voice. But... Uh, Sir, I'll just make this uh, uh, your your analogy there about the the keys and the locks. I think it might be a better one to say each person had a piece of the puzzle, and when they put them all together, then you've got a complete. All right, you've got a complete uh, uh, picture. You've got a, com a complete or finished book. Really, is what we have here. But the bottom line is the parts all have to be the same. They have to be. A, a, a part of whatever the whole is. If you have a piece of pie, I can assure you, no one's going to say, well, here's a piece of pie. It must have come out of that cake. No, you don't get pie out of cake. That's not a part of the whole. See that? So it has to look like or be the same characteristics of whatever is in part. That's what the whole is. And so when that which is perfect has come, it can't be Jesus. It has to be whatever was in part, and that is what was being revealed? Your own word, my Lord. Hi, James. Uh, you kind of threw me back when you was doing the video and said uh, you didn't see that coming. But, you know, uh, anybody who doesn't pick up the Bible, if somebody starts talking, they could uh, 
say they're a prophet and they don't know anything. I could, I could tell everybody, well, you know, the end's coming and a whole lot of them are going to hell. And uh, they think I'm a prophet, but all they got to do is pick up the Bible and they know it themselves. Right. And there's been a lot of people in, the, <clears throat> in recent years that have uh, tried to tell everybody that the end is coming. Uh, what, Harold Camping and, you know, several times he tried to convince everybody and they sell their cars, whatever, but, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't predict it either. So, but, um, well, I appreciate your call. All right, we appreciate All right. the program. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. All right, so, so whatever the part, the whole is, has to have the same characteristic of the perfect. All right, so here's what we're looking at. What was it that was in part then? It was the method of revealing the will of God. Now, friends, that's pretty simple. When you look at what was being revealed and who was revealing it and how it was being revealed, you'll see that the, the perfect was being revealed in different ways and manners by different people, but it was always about the Word of God. Notice in Mark 16, 16 through 20, we just read this, they confirmed the Word with miracles. The Word was being confirmed by those signs that were following. And then you have in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, notice this, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15, <coughs> Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So Paul is saying, look, you've been taught the inspired word of God in a couple of ways. You've heard it directly spoken, and you've had letters written to you. And so then you, when you look at 2 Corinthians uh, 4 and verse 7, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7, Paul says, We have this treasure in earth and vessel. What treasure? What treasure do you have, uh, Paul? Well, he's talking about the gospel. Notice this. 2 Corinthians, we're still in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, uh, uh, verse, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, uh, or nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves, <coughs> commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, to whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So what he's talking about? He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about preaching the gospel. We don't preach ourselves. We preach Christ. Uh, uh, the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus Christ's sake, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What brings knowledge? What is it that, that Paul is preaching? It's the word of God. And then he says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. The word was being given in various ways and shapes until the perfect was come, it was being revealed. It was being spoken. It was being confirmed by miracles every time it was being spoken. It was being written down. It was being circulated around. Everybody was putting together these letters. And now, friends, we have the Word of God. And everywhere you find the Word being spoken, you hear it talking about being confirmed. You hear it talking about being confirmed, uh, the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 2. Notice this, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. The word was being revealed. It was in part, in pieces. Different, different shapes and sizes, if you will. But when you put them all together, you have the complete and final revealed Word of God. Paul, Peter, Mark, Matthew, James, Jude, they all had pieces. And they were all writing down their part. It was, always, it was being preserved. But when the pieces were all come together, guess what you have? 
you have the inspired word of God. And that's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, thoroughly furnished with all good works. How is he going to do that? How do you have, <clears throat> how do you have a tool that is complete and suitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness by completely putting it all together. It's right here. Here's your tool set right here. You want to reprove, you want to rebuke, you want to exhort with all long suffering your doctrine, here's your tool. Here's the part, I mean, here's the whole that is made up of different parts that were, that were put together by different individuals putting in their own piece of the puzzle to come to the to come to the perfect. And so modern day prophets, modern day prophets do not look anything like the prophets of the Old Testament or even the New Testament for that matter. Because notice this, all the different parts had to agree. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 37, he said, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. And so if somebody comes up and says they are a prophet or a prophetess and what they're saying or doing is contrary to what the Bible says, guess what? I'm going to say about that prophet. They're not really a prophet of God. They're not really a prophet of God. Uh, <clears throat> consider this. Now, I'm, I'm going to get ready in case this, uh, uh, this, this video doesn't play. Let me just get right here. This is uh, Wayne Parks, and he is a so-called prophet. Uh, this is preaching under uh, Bill Daniels, Prophet Bill Daniels' uh, tent. I guess it's a tent. Uh, but he's going to talk about uh, the Holy Spirit. Claims to be a prophet. You can see his name there. So let's just see if he uh, meets the standard for prophets or for being a prophet. Well, we'll do it this way with oil in the name of Jesus, I really believe what you are saying is, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus and bring him into the midst of what I have anointed. Well, that's shout, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. You got a child burning up with fever, you put some oil on it. Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. You're standing down at the courthouse and it looks like you're going to lose the case. Hallelujah. You start anointing everything at the courthouse in the name of Jesus with holy oil. You're saying, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus and bring him right here into this courthouse. Hallelujah. When you go into the hospital with your bottle of oil, you're saying, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. Hallelujah. Somebody say, praise God. Holy Ghost, go get Jesus and bring him into the midst of whatever this problem is that we've got. You got that application for a car, application for a job, application for a house, application for a loan laying out there before you. You just go ahead and put that oil on it and you say, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus and let him rise on this application. Why? Because you let the Holy Ghost go get Jesus and get involved in whatever it was you were asking him to do for you. Woo! Hallelujah! Now, the Bible says, not the oil. The oil is just a type of the Holy Ghost. The oil is giving a legal invitation for the Holy Ghost to go get Jesus. All right. Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. Now, I've got a, I've got a free muscle and shovel book to anybody that can call in and tell what the problem with what he said was. Did it agree or did it not agree with what the Bible says? Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. Now, if you, if you will call in and answer that question, 
If you know the answer to that question, we've got a free muscle and shovel going out to you. <clears throat> but here's the thing, just a, a little observation. You start putting oil on everything, on your application and stuff, friends, I, I don't know that the, the bank or wherever you're trying to get a loan, they're going to really want that if it's got oil all over it. You think they would? And you go down to the courthouse, start slinging oil around, you might be, you might be uh, uh, up for another charge or something. So what is it that Mr. That Mr. Oh, we got a, we got a caller here. All right. You got an answer here. Hi, right, James. Aren't, aren't all of them one, one entity? Um, no. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not. They're one in, in purpose, but they're different individuals. Right. So that's, what I, that's, I, that's that, what I was thinking. If that, that, yeah, that's not the answer. One in purpose. All right. I'm sorry. All right. All right. Not the answer. All right. <clears throat> Anybody else want to try? We're running out of time here. Listen, remember, remember the whole purpose of prophecy. Or, or, or the, the key about prophecy. Remember we just read, we read this? It has to agree with the rest of it. There's the hint. All the different parts of prophecy have to agree if it's from God. So, all right, here's the answer. Here's the answer. He said, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. Well, listen to what the Bible says. In John 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. Now, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus? No. God, the Father, is going to send the comforter. Look at this. John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Now, Mr. Prophet, so-called prophet, Wayne Park says, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. But the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father. That, it was, that he was sent. That the Holy Spirit was not here, but he was sent. Let's look at some more here. John 15, 26, But when the Comforter has come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. So God is going to send the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Christ is going to send the Holy Spirit and the Comforter. It's not the Holy Spirit go get Jesus. Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit. Was going to send the Holy Spirit. John 16 verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. See, Prophet Wayne Parks is not really a prophet because he's got it just backwards. He's saying, Holy Ghost, go get Jesus. But all that we know about the Holy Spirit was Christ was going to send the Holy Spirit. See, he's got it just backward, not to mention the fact that the Holy Spirit is not going to come down today. He's certainly not, and if he were, he wouldn't be here as a gopher boy to go get Jesus. So you see where the problem is? Modern day prophets are always saying backwards and doing opposite of what the Bible always says. Just like the prophetess under the tent. If she, if she was truly a prophetess, number one, she had known she's going to be examined, like the caller said. But number two, she would also know that the Bible said that Paul says, I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over man. And that the women should keep be silent in the church when it comes to preaching. They, they don't have the authority. Now, if she was a real prophetess, she'd known that. See what we're dealing with? So, friends, the problem that we always that we're dealing with is people are trying to get a word from the Lord from these so-called people that are not really prophets. If you want a word from the Lord, you don't need to go to one of these so-called prophets or prophetesses that are telling you everything opposite what the Bible says, you need to get back to the Bible. Now someone says, well, what about Ephesians 4 and verse 11? We've just got a few minutes here. What about Ephesians 4 11? He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. I want you to notice this, friends. You might be saying, well, we have evangelists and there are pastors and there are teachers why aren't there apostles and prophets? Well, that's a good question. 
That's a good question. Notice Ephesians 4 and verse 13. Ephesians 4 and verse 13. Here's the context. He says, we have, the, these were placed in the church for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith. There it is. It gets back to the perfect. It gets back to the complete or the whole. And once the complete or the whole is given, you don't need the pieces. Once, the, once all the, the puzzle has been completed, you don't need the little pieces that help bring it. You just don't need those things. So, just like when Paul said, you know in part, when that which is perfect is come, that which is part shall be done away. What Jude said in Jude 3, the faith once delivered. The faith has once and for all finally delivered. It's completely delivered. We don't need any more pieces of the puzzle of revelation because we have them all right here. All that we need for life and godliness is right here, friends. That's all we need. So why do you keep, why do you keep insisting that we need prophets or pieces of the puzzle when the word has always been revealed? If you're building a wall, you put a scaffold up, build a building. You put a scaffold up, you put the walls up, brick and mortar. But do you keep the masonry tools out? Do you keep the scaffolding up once the wall's built or do you take them down? See, the miraculous gifts, prophecy, those were just parts. Those are just tools that were used to bring the perfect. All right, we've got one call. you got 30 seconds. Go. You're on word from the Lord. Go. you got 30 seconds. Yes. Yes, it was it, um... Yes, well, uh, where did Acts 1-8 come from? Acts 1-8? Acts 1-8 came in, uh, yes, sir, I received the power after that the Holy Ghost have come up on you. He was talking to the apostles. Acts, Acts. He was talking to the apostles there. I, I'm not denying that, but that's not today. That's not today, but the Holy Ghost is, is the Holy Ghost is the keeper. Now, what verse are you talking about now? The Holy Verse is a Holy Ghost is a keeper. What, yes, what? The Holy Ghost is a keeper. And you got to give me Holy a scripture. Ghost is, is a keeper. I mean, we got the Holy Ghost. We got the Holy Spirit in there too, but they 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 they, they still occur different burns. Okay. Uh, you want to stay on the line? I'll talk I to you. I'm trying to get away from the Holy Ghost, but that don't work. You can't turn that out the tape. Well, the Holy Spirit does not work today like he did in the first century. We have the inspired word of God. Whatever the word does, whatever you say the spirit does, the word can do. If you want to stay on the line, I'll talk to you, but I got to go. You want to stay on the line? Okay. All right, thanks for your call. All right, friends, we're out of time. But I want you to know we appreciate you, you watching. And, uh, you know, if you want, really want a word from the Lord, there's only one place to go. It's from the Bible. Always ask, what does the Bible say? And you'll get a word from the Lord. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. But apparently you don't know truth. Because if you knew truth, you wouldn't teach your people, watch it, that they're under law of Moses with tithe and mechanical instruments of music. Now you're bringing the tithing over and the instrumental music over but what about the burnt offering? I hear the music, but I don't smell no beat. Where's the beat? Where's the beat? In these churches, they got, in your church, every one of them, they got mechanical music, they teach tithing, right? I don't smell no beat. Where's the beat? You had to go back to the Old Testament to get the music. You had to go back to the Old Testament to get the time. Why didn't you bring in the, the beat? Where's the beat? All the congregation worship. So they were worshiping on the Lord Moses. And had singers sing, trumpets sound, and all of this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Ask your pastor, some of you people are watching this television program, 
Ask your pastor. Hey, where's the meat? I don't think there's anybody back there.